Hi friends, it's Monica and today we're going to be reading some one-star reviews of my favorite books from people. So like I was just saying, I'm going to be reading some one-star reviews of my favorite books and this will be on Goodreads and I won't be showing like people's usernames and stuff like that because it's a little bit weird too in my opinion but I'm just going to be reading and reacting to all of them and I do have my laptop right here so I will be looking down and I think I will either have screenshots or like a screen recording in this space over here so you'll be able to see what I am reacting to. Okay, so let's just jump right in. So this first book I have right here is A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. So I know a lot of people have a lot of controversial opinions about this book, but let's see what people have to say about it. Okay, so this one person says they had a hard time reading this book because of the hype and they're wondering if they would rated it this book differently if they read it at a different time. And that is valid because Sirius is so hyped and it's not up to everyone's taste of reading. But this is kind of where Sarah gets out of her PG-13 kind of era and she's dipping into what she what I think she would want to be an adult fantasy writer. And this person is saying that A Court of Thorns and Roses is supposed to be a retelling of Beauty and the Beast but they are not seeing so many connections to it and that many parallels with it. And it really isn't a fairy tale retelling, it's just a fantasy book with some elements really loosely based on Beauty and the Beast and I think it's valid of their points there. Okay, and then in this next part they're saying like the plot it was also okay, Tamlin was a bit boring for them and Farah was an okay heroine and a little bit lacking in some qualities I believe. And they're they're also noting that Farah is being overshadowed by the men in Akatar mainly being Tam, Lucian, and Reese. And I do kind of see that, that they have more in-depth character qualities and a background to them. But I do think Feyre does come from a place of struggles and also how she's trying to figure out how to just keep her family alive and healthy and hunting food for them. So I do have to disagree with that because I think Feyre does have some depth to her character and it's because she's also young compared to the Fae characters in this book and them being like, I don't know, hundreds of years older than her. So I do have to disagree with that point. And I really like this review. It's like going really into in depth of what they disliked about everything. And there's another point here that I'm just kind of like skimming through. They're saying it's mainly strong male character leads and one main female character. And of course the male characters can't seem to get enough of the main heroine. They're all in love with her, all of them. So yes, that is a valid point. In Sarah J Maas's books, the, the love interests tend to all gravitate towards the main female character and they all seem to be in love with her. <laughs> I think this is more of a common theme in Sarah J Maas's books, even with her latest series, Crescent City, because I do notice how in that book, Bryce is the it girl, like everyone wants to be with her, etc, etc. So I understand where this person is coming from and that's okay. Okay, and this person, they rated Akatar one and a half stars and they're pretty much saying that Feyre is worrying about the most ridiculous things and how at the very first day after she got kidnapped, suddenly thought her captor was a love interest. I'm not kidding you here because why else would she kept wondering if he actually remembered her name? And they're saying the book was repetitive and long-winded with so much unnecessary information. And I guess to that, I could say there was the beauty and the beast aspect of Feyre being kidnapped by Tamlin and being forced to stay in, in like the Springlands for like a repayment for killing the the Fae, the Fae wolf. I think Feyre, she had some valid worries, but then I guess the switch of going immediately from this is my kidnapper to like, oh, He's now my love interest because I just know what happened with Tamlin. So this person's point is again valid. But I, I wouldn't say that the book was repetitive or long-winded because then you do see how there's a lot of different aspects of Akatar and the world of Akatar coming into place together. That everything does have a purpose and a place in this plot. I guess there are some unnecessary things, maybe the romance of Tamlin and Vera, but I think it was necessary for the build-up of what happens in 
um, the end of this book as well as like later books. So with Akatar, I understand where the one star reviews are coming from. It is a little bit ridiculous in the terms of how Tamlin is considered to be Feyre's love interest and how I think Akatar was the book for Sarah to, to push out of her comfort zone and kind of pushing the boundaries of like what her readers would expect from her. I don't r recall exactly when Sarah started to have more mature scenes in her books but I do remember Akatar being one of the first and in terms of Tamlin and Feyre's storyline it does pay off that's how I'm gonna see. It does pay off in the end of the day. So my next favorite book I'm gonna be talking about is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by B.E. Schwab. I really enjoyed this one. It was really nice to read about a woman who makes a deal with the devil to be living forever and she doesn't understand the consequences of that until she finds out later after she made the deal that she is only visible to the man who is the devil or who is depicted as the devil in this book and she's invisible to everyone else until she meets someone who can see her like 300 years later. The first review I have here is someone saying that they think the book is so monotonous, repetitive, and shallow, and it could have been a hundred the story would have been the same. I do have to agree with this particular point because I did find some parts of Addie LaRue was repetitive and mostly I got bored at the parts with Henry and Addie. I didn't like those two characters together because I really wanted like a morally great romance to happen but and this person is also saying how Addie doesn't really have much character development and she just kind of talks to people and having conversations with them but then I think this person also forgot that Addie is not able to make a mark on people. She is not able to actually have people remember her so then she does try again and again and again which does make sense for the repetitive nature of this book and that Addie is trying to make a connection with people so I think in that this person does point out that Addie doesn't really develop much in her character throughout the years maybe she does develop in ways that are less known I guess to us because then again, she's walking around Earth and nobody ever remembers her for over 300 years so I could see how Addie is struggling to even mature in herself. But then I think she does realize that the deal she made with the devil was not a good one and she does try to break out of that cycle of her trying to prove to Luke who is the devil who she, who she made the deal with, that she doesn't need him. And I do have to agree with this person's review that they thought that once Addie found the mysterious person that saw her and actually remembers her, that it would bring more pace to the story. But about another character that walks aimlessly around moping and feeling bad for himself, I do agree with that with Henry. But I think with the concept of the book and me continuing to read and consume this book, I still did rate it five stars. Even though some characters, Henry in particular, wasn't the most interesting person to read about, I still wanted to find out more about what Addie went through and how she can overcome that even with someone who was as boring as Henry. <laughs> okay, so this next review for Addie LaRue is saying that they couldn't relate to Addie LaRue and they couldn't really care about her experiences as well as the their lack of enjoyment of the romance and characters and it was boring and the only thing that was enjoyable about this book was the writing so i do agree with again like what i mentioned before like some characters were boring henry but i did think the writing itself was the epitome of v.e schwab it's a testament to v.e schwab's writing skills and how she can craft such a wonderfully and beautifully written book. There were some aspects of Addie LaRue that could have been better and should have been a little bit more entertaining. And uh, relating to Addie, I guess for this particular reviewer, they didn't relate to her, but I think with myself, I kind of see where Addie was struggling with her life in the beginning of this book before she made the deal with Luke. From what I could recall was Addie was either in an arranged marriage or being married to someone she didn't really want to or be being trapped in that really monotonous life that she didn't want to be trapped in. Like she lived in that small French town all her life and 
if she got married, she'd just be staying there forever. So that's why she made that deal. I could understand why Addie was adamant to get out of that town and get out of that life that she had, but she made a bad and rash decision about what she wanted to do. I think that's like one of the other parts for myself while reading this book how I related to her, like I could understand where Addie's coming from. I could just see like behind Addie's motivations of why she made those choices that she did. With Addie LaRue, she is a interesting character and she does make some interesting choices in her life. And I think that one reviewer did bring up a really good point about the book being quite repetitive, but I think that was the point of the book as well. Since the concept of no one remembering you, it will result in a repetitive cycle of your life and you trying to form a connection with someone, but then they ultimately forget you when they lose sight of you. So I think with that point in mind, it does come with the territory of this particular plotline. But I still love Addie LaRue and I think one day I will reread it and maybe my opinion will change a bit. Moving on to the next book I have is The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. So this book is a high fantasy book and it's an enormous series. It's a thousand pages, like literally every book installment is a thousand plus pages and it's an intricate world, really easy to read and grasp the concepts of this fantasy world especially with the magical system. I love Brandon Sanderson's writing, so let's see what people have to say about this one. Okay, so I did find one review that's not so long. I'm just trying to find like shorter reviews, so again, I'm not commenting on every single thing that each person is saying. But this one person is saying that they thought The Way of Kings was a verbose, bloated, complex, and a disjointed mess with characters going into circles about the battle flashback after flash forward and constantly changing voices and they thought that maybe it could have been a lot shorter than it had to be but I think with um, Brandon Sanderson I just found this particular book of his and the f it's the first book in a long fantasy series 10 books I believe I found it really easy myself to read so I could see if trying to get into Brandon Sanderson or high fantasy books it can be a little bit intimidating and it is an investment <laughs> it's a lot of investment of time and your energy to learn through all the characters and all the new world building that you're trying to grasp for the world that's being created for you. This person did comment about how his overall theme is laudable, life before death, strength before weakness, journey before destination. So the clever complexity feels more like schizophrenic disorganization with so many books and so little time to choose carefully. So like I said before, it's kind of more the same thing. It's like you choose what you want to read. You don't need to read what's most popular right now, even though that's what happens a lot with a lot of books. It was really hyped off. People, of course, they get curious and they tend to pick it up. But this person did give Brandon some positive points on the world building of all the different races, cultures, ethnicities, class structures, and the world of fauna flora terrans and extreme ecospheres and civilizations. So like there are positives to this review as well. And they did say they are not an epic fantasy uh, reader. So I understand where this person is coming from. It can be overwhelming for non-epic fantasy readers to pick up this book. So the second review for Way of Kings discusses how they don't like the use of the spren that keep um, popping up in the book. This reviewer does mention how the spren are narratively convenient. So yes, there are points in <laughs> the series where it shows how there's like spren, like li little magical creatures. They do have a huge impact on the plot and the storyline as well as on our characters themselves. So I do agree that sometimes it can be convenient for certain things to happen. It can seem like they are just added to the plot just for fun or just for the sake of pushing forward the story. But me, I did read the second book. The Spren do play a huge role in the story and I do have to agree to disagree with this person. And this reviewer is saying how Caledon seems way too mature for his age and is behaving a lot more older than what he says he is in the book. And again, I, I test that to like Caledon's own experience of being a slave and being forced every day to risk his life doing the bridge runs. 
and I believe Callahan also faces like a form of depression I would say and that is seen throughout the book so I think when you go through certain life experiences it can make you age a lot faster than what you are of what your age is and I do believe that it can be a little bit distracting to the plot when you have someone who claims to be young but then is acting really older than who they are. For myself, I, I take into account of like what the character has been through and I maybe analyze them too deeply but that's how I read books and that's why I love reading books. So again, I disagree with that point but I understand where this person is coming from. I guess my point with Brandon Sanderson, he's not everyone's favorite author. I do love his writing myself and I think that in the end it will be up to the person of whether they like his writing or not but for me i really do love the sermon archive and i do plan to finish this series this next book is a good girl's guide to murder by holly jackson and this was my top favorite 2021 pick of the year i really enjoyed this one it's a ya murder mystery and we're following pippa who is experiencing her own investigation of a closed murder case and she makes a podcast out of it and a lot of things follow from that so i found a one star review and this review is saying how maybe they don't like teen murder mysteries anymore because they're quite unbelievable in the terms of not being able to believe the plot line to actually happen in real life. So like their main issue with this book was Pippa herself and her questionable character choices. So I do kind of agree with that point how Pippa is doing research on this closed murder mystery case and she decided to continue to contact the victim's family and that might not be the most ethical way to approach this because she is just a high school student at this point and when Pippa tries to get some evidence and tries to connect the dots of what could have been possibly the truth versus what has been told to the public and like she doesn't really follow like ethical guidelines because she's an independent investigator at this point and so she's not under strict regulations so this reviewer does say that she blackmails people she pretends to be a reporter she catfishes friends of the victim she also manipulates her own friends so i do understand why they dislike the character of pippa and i think pippa for me was really motivated by her own will to solve this closed murder mystery because it did happen in her town and she like picked up on the possibilities of maybe the murder case was not investigated in the proper way so she took it upon herself to solve it so with that she does end up making a lot of questionable choices Pippa is a flawed character and <laughs> we see that flawed character <laughs> traits in the later two books in the series and it really does make for an entertaining read because Pippa can be a character that you really don't like but for me I couldn't help but root for her. This next review is saying that Pippa again is an annoying main character and she has kind of a savior complex that she needs to save everyone and she's not like all the other girls. Pippa manages to rope in a lot of people in her life and she thinks a lot of people in her own life are suspects of this murder case. I do have to agree with that as well because Pippa does kind of just form this need to solve this murder case even though it was pronounced as resolved to the public but she wanted to dig in deeper. I think Pippa herself becomes very paranoid. The murderer at large is trying to mess with her because she is onto something and that something is the truth. I do see why um, Pippa has the underlying feeling and emotion to save everyone because she started this investigation when she didn't have to in the first place. Her own family and close friends are kind of like what's going on here are you okay because <laughs> i think pippa has declared in her own mind that she is all important and she does need to solve this case no matter what this review also mentions how pippa made a lot of random choices and there's also convenient timing and events that happen in the book that results in pippa being right i think with murder mysteries there has to be instances of those convenient plot lines but i think with Holly Jackson, she does do a good job and 
making you guessing if you're not fully 100% paying attention to every single clue that might have been laid out for you. Like myself, reading throughout this A Good Girl's Guide to Murder series, there was like little hints and clues in earlier books as well as that results in huge consequences to the plotline and characters themselves that I didn't pick up on. So maybe it's this person was a little bit more observant while reading the book. I was surprised and shocked at how some events turned out. So I do understand why this person has their mind to add while reading this book and reading it one star. But I do think that for myself well, and my experience with reading this book, it was just different overall. In conclusion, I did really love the series, but I do think it does help for me to read other people's reviews, especially like bad reviews of my favorite books, because it does bring up like different issues that I may have not noticed when I first read through these books. And anyways, moving on to my next book, it's All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. So this one's a World War II historical fiction book, and I just remember crying in this one, and let's see how people think of this one. So this one review starts off as questioning, why are all prize-winning books so depressing? So this book is a historical fiction, there is a sad ending, and it did make me cry. And it takes a lot for a book to make me cry, and with this one, it did cause that emotion in me, and I think that's why I did rate this one as five stars. And I think with this historical fiction book, it is depressing because it is about war, and it's about two different people who are on opposite sides of the war, interacting with each other, and you learn of their stories. And with both characters in this book, um, this reviewer is saying that it is an interesting story but not an engaging one and they couldn't connect to the characters and the plot seemed to be dragging for them. With the characters in this book, I did think they had a unique story but I guess you could label it as not being personally connected to them. We do follow a blind French girl and a German boy who is involved with the Nazis. We do find them in their two separate storylines, so they're both disconnected from each other and you're kind of waiting to see them meet in the middle or meet at a point in the book. So I could see how you could be disconnected to the characters, but for me personally, I did find it engaging because I wanted to know more about what these characters are going through and what they could possibly do if they even meet in the book. I think this person does make a valid point that strategies are capitalized in like the entertainment industry and I think that just brings people to watch or read whatever form of media you're consuming because it helps to bring people back to their roots of human emotion. <laughs> I'm getting a little bit philosophical here but with all the light we cannot see it reminds you to consider what it's like to be human again and to reconnect with your own emotions and I think with maybe this reviewer they just kind of saw the pattern of like okay this is just another historical fiction book that is not the most happiest to read about and they did make a good comment here that it says it feels just a bit odd to turn truly horrifying events into something beautiful and poetical. I feel there's a real danger to viewing events through rose-tinted glasses. They make a really 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 good point here because we do see a lot of maybe bad stories or bad events being glorified and romanticized that it can take away the true meaning of the book or movie or tv show. And for me it can be like that. I think the concept of this entire historical fiction book is to bring that image of following this character through these horrible horrible events that has happened in the past and remembering why we even tell these stories of why we even bother to read about these stories because if we don't remember the people who experience those tragedies and we need to be careful of not passing or crossing that line of glorifying these bad events. So this review was really really good and well worded and it did make me think a lot but I do appreciate the challenging insight that this particular review brought to me. So moving on to another review. So this reviewer says that the story read like a never-ending description of things that were only loosely connected and even with the lush detail that I was written with they couldn't picture a thing. So they felt that they were kind of blind like the blind character 
in this book, Marie. With Anthony Doerr's writing, it does come to that point of being maybe too lush, too descriptive, and it makes you lose interest in the book. So I understand that point. They also bring up the point that there are things constantly happening to the characters rather than the characters having a overarching goal or objective for themselves. And I do think that is a good point as well because in a book, you do want to see your characters be motivated by not just things happening around them, but them having a goal in mind. So from those two points, I do think that they do bring up really good points. I remember reading this book way back when, whenever I read this book. I remember the prose being very extensive and it is really descriptive. And I do think it did pull me in to be more interested in what the characters are going through. It can be sometimes hard to find that personal connection to certain characters, but I did think I understood with both characters of their own struggles and how they're trying to continue and survive in their place in the world right now, in World War II. Events are happening to the characters, but it's not in their control because sometimes in life you do have events that you do not have control over and that makes you lift up your own expectations of what to do next. And I think with both the young French blind girl and the young German boy, they had that struggle within themselves. They had to follow what was going to happen next because their own life had been upheaved <laughs> dramatically and now their goals and motivations might not be 100% concrete for them either. So I do understand the, this, the point that this reviewer brought up with me just taking in the circumstances surrounding the characters that it may have been a lot more complex for them to then just simply say, okay, I'm gonna run away or something. With all the light we cannot see, the underlying point for me or the theme for me in this book was that sometimes humans are just people as well. We have to remember that we all have our own stories. We all live our own lives. And again, I'm getting a lot philosophical here. So I'm gonna conclude this portion and move on to my last book. So my last book is To All the Boys of Love Before by Jenny Han. This is a really fun young adult romance contemporary series and I just remember reading this book and it was just fun for me so I want to see what other people thought about this one. This reviewer is saying that they don't know how this book has a 4 plus rating on Goodreads and they're pretty sure Pretty wrote this. There's not a single character they like and that Peter Kravinsky is not really a good guy. There's nothing that could save them in this reviewer's eyes. And Lara Jean is a whiny 17 year old. Okay, so this review is a little bit more harsher. <laughs> it is a young adult book, so it does read younger and it does read easier than other books. So that's my first point. And I do have to agree that the movies are better than the books, but I still really enjoyed the books for what they were. And I do remember reading about Lara Jean and Peter Kravinsky and their romance and, and the fake dating trope. I just had a lot of fun with this book so I didn't really take it as serious as say reading a fantasy book. But with contemporary romances, they are either a hit or miss for me. So I do understand why this reviewer can be saying that, that they thought the characters themselves are falling flat and they don't really have much going for them. So this next reviewer is saying that they felt that it was a little bit weird to have Josh, Lara Jane's sister's ex-boyfriend, so Margot's ex-boyfriend, how Josh behaved a little bit strangely. And I do think maybe that aspect of the book I did not like. This reviewer is also saying that Lara Jean and Peter didn't really have chemistry. So for this particular book series, I did end up watching the movie before reading the books so i think that influenced my opinion of the series with book Lara Jean and peter i did find them to have chemistry like they had that cute awkward flirty energy that i really like and the fake dating situation helped as well i think there could have been more substance to the overall relationship but overall i do still enjoyed this book and it was really fun to read with these one star reviews it's nice again to have that different perspective being brought to light I think it's really fun to look back on to what my first initial thoughts of these books were that I consider as my favorites and kind of just thinking back right now of 
that maybe it's okay to still enjoy a book and consider that there are some issues with them and overall with these reviews i didn't choose long ones <laughs> i mainly chose like medium paragraph ones so i could have gone more in depth that's all the books that i'm going to be talking about and reacting to one star goodreads reviews too i hope you enjoyed watching this video thanks so much for tuning in don't forget to give me a big huge thumbs up hit that subscribe button down below and ring that notification bell to not miss any future uploads i'll see you all soon